Hello, this video is entitled Partial Fractions, or perhaps it should be titled Partial Integrating Functions with Partial Fraction Decomposition. I'm sure many of you have taken a pre-cal class, you know, you have studied partial fractions, the idea of partial fractions, but now we're going to apply calculus to it by integrating the results. So some of it, if you haven't, that's fine too, because I'm going to go over all the basic uh, concepts that we need for partial fractions. But if you have seen it, you know, this should be pretty familiar to you. All right, now a uh, partial fraction is taking something like this, where you see you have this uh, x squared minus 6x plus 8 in this denominator. And, and we're trying to simplify something into two smaller, two or more smaller components. So this will have, the, this factors into x minus 2 and x minus 4. And we can assign some random value that we're going to solve for, A, to be with x minus 2, and B with x minus 4. Now, it's very important to realize that it does not matter where you put the A and the B. That makes no difference. I could have put A over x minus 4, and I could have put B over x minus 2. You know, whatever the correct value that's supposed to go over that denominator will be found no matter what letter you put here above it. So what you do now if you get this step is multiply everything by the denominator on the left side because that's going to be the least common multiple. Whatever each of these denominators are the factors of that denominator. So every time the first step is always going to be clearing out the left side denominator, which in this case would just leave you a 1 here on top. So, when you, so I'm showing you that in this factored form, you're multiplying by both of these factors. So when you get to this one, cancel the x minus 2s. That's going to leave you an x minus 4 with it. Then you come over here, you cancel the x minus 4s. That's going to leave an x minus 2. And then uh, one method, I'm going to show you another method to do this one, to do these problems. But that wouldn't be much help for this one. This one's easy enough to do this way. Is pick a value for x. That will zero out one of the components here, either no matter what order you're doing in. For example, if I let x equals 2 and I substitute 2 for x in here, b is going to go away because that will produce 0 in the parentheses and that will eliminate variable b, which enables us to solve for a. So I put 2 in there. b goes away. 2 minus 4 is negative 2, a. And then I have 1 on the left side. So 1 equals negative 2a, so a equals negative 1 half. Now I can start over again, and I can let x equal 4 here to get rid of a and solve for b. So if x equals 4, I'll have 4 minus 2 times b will give me 1. That means 2b equals 1, so b would equal 1 half. And that means the partial fraction decomposition for 1 over x squared minus 6x plus 8 would be the same as negative 1 half over x minus 2 plus 1 half over x minus 4. So you see how you've broken that original fraction into smaller fractions. Now the idea for doing this from a calculus standpoint is we are breaking it down into simpler individual integrals. That's the whole idea behind this. So let's say this had been an, an integration problem, like so. We would have broken it down into these two integrals. Now, obviously, the constants can come outside. And then 1 over x minus 2, the antiderivative is just natural log of the absolute value of x minus 2. And then the absolute value of x minus 4, natural log for this other integral with their coefficients in front, and then, of course, your plus c. Now, this particular textbook I've worked out of before at Larson, don't, don't worry about all this. Don't do this, especially, but uh, hypothetically, this problem could be done by trig substitution. So, you know, I guess if you're interested in that, I'm not going to go through all the details, but if you want to look at it and uh, uh, see what you think, you know, but uh, it's correct. I didn't, I didn't finish the problem, though. I just stopped right here. So we would have ended up with a tangents would have canceled, would have been secant over tangent. 
then we would have gone uh, what, to signs and cosines probably would have been the next move. One over cosine, sine over cosine, one over sine, which is cosecant. And the antiderivative of cosecant is the natural log of cosecant plus cotangent. The negative of that, excuse me. It would have produced this, but it would have produced them uh, together in, in one natural log. And remember, log properties work to where, you know, the, the, the lo two, two log sums can be put together as a product. The log of a fraction is the same thing as subtracting. And anyway, as you know, as I mentioned here, not recommended. Now let's look at the different cases here for uh, decomposition of partial fractions. We have now. I, technically, that zero thing I put in there is not really a case. It's more of, I could have just put it in there as a statement without the zero, but it means first thing first is you have to, your, if your fraction is improper, you have to divide first because partial fractions will not work. Meaning if the leading power in the numerator is greater or equal to the leading power in the denominator. So let me scroll back up here for a second. So if this, if this integral back here, right here, if that would have had an x squared, or higher power, not a fractional power, just integer power, x squared or higher in the numerator, I would have had to do long division first before I could have done partial fractions. So I guess technically that's the first step no matter what, even though it's not one of the cases. So we're going to talk about all these in more detail. The, the first case and the easiest case, uh, which was an example of what I just did a minute ago, uh, it's called distinct linear, linear factors, meaning you, you have just different linear factors. The last problem we had was an x minus 2 and an x minus 4. Repeated linear factors would be a, 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 the same factor more than once, you know, often just raised to a power. Like if you had x cubed, that's a repeated factor of x. Or like x minus 3 squared, that's a repeated linear factor because it's 2x minus 3s. Quadratic factors, uh, meaning that they have no real solution. So that's very important. Uh, you'll see when we get to that, like x squared plus 4 would fall in this cat category. They would be quadratics that have only imaginary solutions, no real numbers. Now, not, so not all quadratics would satisfy this. For example, if it was x squared minus 4, that would not satisfy this because if you can factor the quadratic, that's what you do. So x squared, and same thing with the one we example we just did in the other page. That did not fit this case because it factored. So if it's factorable, there's no way it fits this case. And then a repeated quadratic is a combination of 2 and 3. So let's start off with just distinct linear factors, case 1. Now sometimes, you know, you may have to factor your numerator, denominator, obviously. some Like we did even with the last example, we had to factor. So be prepared for that, but not going to be overly complicated. So it's pretty simple here. x cubed minus 4x, factor out an x. x squared minus 4, factors into x minus 2, x plus 2. So that gives us three linear factors. x, x minus 2, x plus 2. As I mentioned before, regarding this, this has an a, a, b, and a c. So since it has another letter, it does not matter. What I said before still applies. You can put any letter, any order of the term, A, B's, and C's, over those denominators. So I could have had, like, for example, A over X plus 2. I could have had B over X. I could have had C over X minus 2. And with, you know, with no mistakes being made algebraically, then I would have solved for the uh, correct values, A, B, and C, no matter, you know, for example, if, if uh, well, I'll just look down here. I'll show you this in a minute. C is, C is supposed to be 4. My point being is that that numerator is supposed to be 4. Uh, if I'd have called it A, B, A, or B, it still would have worked out to be 4. So the first thing we do is we, so every step, the denominator on the left side is gone. All you're left with is the numerator. 5x squared minus 12x minus 12. So that's automatically what's left there. 
And then, see, all fractions are gone because we're multiplying by the LCM. Therefore, all these are gone, but now the letters are left with something attached to it. So if you cancel, the X cancels, but you see the other two, X minus 2 and X plus 2, would be left. And then for the uh, B, the X minus 2 would cancel, and it would leave an X and an X plus 2. And then for C, we have an X and an X minus 2. All right. Now here's where I'm going to pick values in. I'll look at this and go, all right, I have an X here next to that B. I have an X next to that C. If I let X equal 0, that's going to wipe out both B and C at the same time. So if I put 0 into the left side, that's going to be negative 12. And I put 0 in here, I'll get negative minus 2 is negative 2. 0 plus 2 is positive 2, so negative 2 times 2 is negative 4. So I have negative 4a equals negative 12. So a would be 3. Now look at the original breakdown here. If I let x equals 2, that will wipe out a, and it will wipe out c, and it leaves b. So if you plug 2 into the left side, I didn't show the arithmetic there, but that's not exactly sophisticated math. Plug 2 in there. Obviously you can use your calculator or whatever, but it'll be negative 16. And then right here, you'll put a 2 and a 2 here. So it's B times 2 times 4. So negative 16 equals 8B. So B would equal negative 2. And the last one, if you let X equal negative 2, that wipes out A and wipes out B because of those factors. And you can solve for C. So if you put negative 2 over into this left side, you'll get 32. I'll put in negative 2 there for the X. Negative 2 minus 2 will be negative 4. So I have 8C, so 8C equals 32. So C equals 4. All right, and then there you go. So you have the breakdown. So A is 3, so it goes over X. B is negative 2, so it goes over X minus 2. And C is 4, so it goes over X plus 2. So the integral of this would be the result of those three separate integrals. I just used a Maple software command that did the didn't didn't here's the whole integral right here, but used the, the did the partial fraction decomposition just to show you that my answer was okay. It has a different order, of course, but so just I was mad at just mainly using that as a check. So three over x will be three natural log of x. Negative 2 over x minus 2 will be negative 2 natural log of x minus 2. And then 4 over x plus 2, the integral of that will be 4 natural log of x plus 2. Now, in the distinct linear factors, you're going to get, they're all going to be natural logs, every one of them. Now, when we get to the other cases, really, there's only three things we're kind of looking for. I've not seen, uh, maybe, uh, I, can't, I don't think there's any other one that could pop up. But the three things you're looking for, they're going to be either natural log or they're going to be a power rule. Like if we had if we had like 3 over x squared here, that would not be natural log. It would just be using the, the power rule. Or arctan. That's going to be another common one. So that's kind of really the only ones we're looking for. And what's interesting a lot of times with this partial fractions is that the um, partial fraction work is usually more involved than the calculus work, really, because... Um, once you get it broken down, the intervals aren't that bad. Let's come down and take, okay, so I just put this one in Maple also. Maple just doesn't use absolute value bars, but really we should use absolute value because it's just protecting the fact that it needs to be positive in there. Let's take a look at this next one that requires division because it's an improper fraction. Like say, all, even that was an X squared on top, it would have been improper. So we have to divide first before we can do partial fractions. Let's see. Now, the way you do this is take the x cubed, the largest one. You divide it by the law. All we care about is the largest term over here. Now, the other terms will come into play whenever we distribute here. But you look at this, you say, okay, x squared. You know, basically, it's x cubed divided by x squared, which gives you x. So we take x. 
and we multiply it by everything over here that's in the divisor. Bring it down here. That would give me an x cubed. x times x is x squared. x times negative 2 is negative 2x. Now, just like if we were doing, you know, whatever, fourth grade, third grade division with just numbers by hand, we would subtract as we were going down here. So this is still subtraction. So it's very important that that first term cancels every time you do this, which it does. And you got to be careful because subtraction, it would have been easy. That's why I also I like to put placeholders in there. You know, you see this doesn't have an x squared term, but it's good to have every power there because that way things line up. So you put this x squared there, and it looks like it would, but it's, it is negative x squared because it's subtraction. It, it's a lot of times students make a mistake, they would call that positive x squared. But basically it's 0 minus 1, which makes negative 1. And then you have negative x minus a minus 2x, the same thing as adding, so it's plus x. And now the 11 is on top, so 11 minus 0 would just be 11. So now I look at this, I have a negative x squared, I have an x squared. So x squared divided by negative x squared is negative 1. And whenever you have a number up here, that means this is going to be your last division step. And then it's over for division. So you have negative 1 times your divisor. So you have negative x squared and a negative x and then a positive 2. So we subtract again. The negative x squareds cancel like they're supposed to. So we have x minus a minus x, which is adding, so it makes it 2x. And, of course, 11 minus 2 is 9. So here's how this fraction breaks down. It breaks into this uh, kind of a quotient part and a remainder part. It's not just individual fractions here. So there's still a fraction here, obviously. But x minus 1, and then you have this fraction part, 2x plus 9, over x squared plus x minus 2. And that's the part we'll use partial fractions on. But we, we will integrate x minus 1 to get the answer, which that's that's kind of super simple. But we, I'm not totally disregarding it, but I'm just showing this is the only part that we have to do partial fractions on. So it's pretty easy once you get to this part. So I chose it factors into x plus 2 and x minus 1. I could have reversed them. But I have to have a over x plus 2 and b over x minus 1. So we clear out the denominators. That will leave 2x plus 9. And that will leave me a times x minus 1 plus b times x plus 2. And then similar to the last problem, then we'll take, uh, I'll put in negative 2 here for x. We'll get rid of b. And that's going to give me negative 2 on the left side would give me 5. And then negative 2 minus 1 is a negative 3. So I have negative 3a equals 5, which means a would equal negative 5 thirds. Now to get rid of a, I'll put in 1 for x. So 1 will give me 11 on the left side. And then 1 plus 2 is 3. So I have 11 equals 3b. So b equals 11 thirds. Alrighty, so those are your two, that's your values A and B. So here's what we have to integrate. So we have to integrate that X minus 1 that was still there. Now we have negative 5 thirds over X plus 2, and then 11 thirds over X minus 1. See, those constants don't affect the integral other than the fact that they're part of the answer. That's all. So you just bring them to the outside is fine. But 1 over X plus 2 is going to be natural log of X plus 2 with a negative 5 thirds in front. And then we have 11 thirds natural log of X minus 1 here. And then antiderivative of x is 1 half x squared. And then antiderivative of negative 1 would be minus x. So that's it. And just for grins, I'll put the answer in maple. That looks like what I got. Very good. Okay, now it gets a little more challenging. That was the easy case. Repeated linear factors. When um, you have a repeated linear factor, including x by itself to raise to a power, you have to put, well, I'll just start with this one. So this one has an x minus 2 cubed, and that's what makes this fall under this case right here, because that factor is raised to a power other than 1, and then x plus 5. You have to use 
uh, we have to create letters for X. And you can start lower power and go to higher power or higher down like I did. But you have to create letters for X minus 2 cubed, X minus 2 squared, and then X minus 2 to the first. You have to have a letter representing each one of those. And then X plus 5, because it's a singular factor, it only needs one letter. But the order of these four do not matter. But all four of those denominators need to be there. And then with an A, B, C, D on top of each of them. So you have to include the power you start with all the way down to the first power. And that includes X. So X to the fourth requires an X to the fourth, an X third, an X squared, and an X. And then an X minus three. So needless to say, you can see how this could really, really get out of hand. I tend not to let it make it be too rough for exam purposes. I don't know if the quiz, quiz ones might be more challenging than even the exam question, possibly, but because you have a little more time to work those out, obviously, with the test, more frustrating. But yeah, so it takes, yeah, I don't want to get into all these kind of too many, too many crazy letters, but it's good to know, it's important to know how to set these up. Now, one thing I'll mention that it says right here, and that didn't apply for either of these two examples, but in this case, and especially all this case and all remaining cases, not the previous case, but the one that's coming up with the quadratic and the repeated quadratic, it, it is possible for one of these terms to be a, to be a zero. You can lose a factor in there, so there'd be no need to freak out if one of them became zero and you lost a term there. I think it's going to come up here in a minute in one of the examples, but so it doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It would be for a distinct linear, but not for this. Now, I just let Maple do these for these particular examples. I, and of course, Maple puts on all kinds of crazy order. But so you see, the that means for this one, the C would have been 1 over 343. And then this term right here, the D would have been negative 1 over 343. This B term would have been negative 1 over 49. And A would have been 1 over 7. That would have been the breakdown for, for that particular one. And then you can kind of see what it is for the next one, too. Yeah, I'm not sure why Maple kind of rearranges the order there. I mean, it's not mathematically wrong, so it's not critical, but don't know why they do that. So there's the breakdown for the bottom example. So let's try this out. This sounds like fun. Well, I've sort of already spoiled this one by showing you what the answer is, but it kind of means now we know what we're shooting for when we get get done here. We have something to come back and check it up against. Make sure. All right, this one's definitely not uh, improper. Well, even you know, even if it was the same power, it still wouldn't be improper because. Theoretically, this even though it's split up like this, this really does have a power of 4 in that denominator, even though they're split apart. Because x cubed times 2x is 2x to the 4th. So even if that had been x cubed on top, this would not have been improper. Now x cubed is going to require an x cubed factor, an x squared factor, an x, and then the, that lone 2x plus 3 by itself. Any order for the A, B, C, D, but we need all four of those factors, even if we should happen to lose one, which we're not going to lose one. When I say lose one, I mean by one of those letters being zero. We still need all of them there. So we're clearing out the denominators. And there's the left side. It's going to be that numerator here. We'd have a 2x plus 3 left. Then for this one, we'd have 1x there, and then 2x plus 3 to get the x cubed. For C, we need an x squared to get the x cubed, times 2x plus 3. And then D, uh, we we'll just leave an x cubed because 2x plus 3 would cancel. Now here's where it starts getting a little kind of interesting versus the distinct linear. You know, I'm going to show you so that this, that the canceling out of, you know, picking the numbers and canceling them out usually won't get you all of the, of the factors. You'll still have to do something more to it. 
In other words, what I'm saying is try to clarify what I just kind of incoherently said by putting a number in there and showing you. So if I put zero in there, that clearly gets rid of B, C, and D. It's going to leave A. So you got one on the left side, and you put zero in here, it gives you three. So three A equals one. That means A equals one third. Now negative three halves will wipe out two X plus three. Why? So it wipes out A, B, and C. Negative three halves on the left side is seven fourths. You can obviously use a calculator to plug that in there. And then I put in negative three halves over here to the D, so you have this. So seven fourths equals negative twenty seven over eight D. Flip the fraction over and multiply. So D is negative fourteen over twenty seven. Now here's where it's interesting. We need B and C. But if you look, there, there's no one to get B, there's no one value that would wipe out A, C, and D at the same time. You know, you can take out two out of the three, but you can't get them all wiped out at, at the same time. Same thing with C. You can't get rid of A, B, and D all at the same time. So here's, here's one way to do this. I'm going to create a, a pair, a system of equations just with two variables, two unknown. And then I can use either substitution or elimination. I usually just use elimination, but if you like substitution, whatever makes you happy. So what I do now is I'm going to uh, choose two different numbers for x. One of them where I create you know, an equation with b's and c's, and then another one I can create with b's and c's. You can choose any letters you want except for those value for the letters x. Excuse me. You choose any value for x except the two that we've already used. The zero, we can't use zero and negative three, one half. That would kind of take us back, you know, we really wouldn't accomplish anything. Now, I don't know, I just pick values. I like to use zero, but obviously zero's been used. It's easy to plug in. So, I just picked one, kind of an easy number to work with. I picked negative one for the bottom one, but you know, if you picked one and two, for example, that would be fine. You can do that if you didn't want to use a negative number. I just picked one and negative one. And then in this equation, I plug in the value that we already know for D for A, which is one third, and then we know what D is, so I'm going to use that. So you see B and C are the only unknown variables here. So I put in one, I get three on the left side, and then put in one and all this business here with A, and I combined, so I took the two fractions here. And combine, move them over the other side and got 50 over 27 equals 5B plus 5C. Now I come here and do the same thing with negative 1. Same idea, in other words. And I get 4 over 27 equals negative B plus C. So now I'm writing them as a system of equations. I, I chose to multiply the bottom one by 5 and add because that would get rid of the B. So there's a lot of different ways you can do it, obviously, whatever. I look at that and go, hey, that'll make that a negative 5B. I can add a positive 5B, and the Bs will cancel. So that's going to give me a 5C plus 5C on the right side, which is 10C. And then over here, I'll get 5 times 4 over 27, which is 20 over 27. Add that to 50 over 27, you get 70 over 27. And therefore, C equals 7 over 27. And then you can take either equation. I just chose the bottom one because that way it didn't have a coefficient other than one or negative one. Didn't have to divide by anything. But then I put in uh, seven over twenty-seven for C, and then just solve for that net B right there. Pretty easy enough. And I got three over twenty-seven, which is actually one ninth. So now I'm checking up. So there's C and B. And there's A and D that we already had. So here's what our integral would look like after you put in A, B, C, and D. Now you have to be careful on D. You know, I was kind of taking the natural log for granted, which was right earlier. But let's say, you know, if it's natural log of X plus 3 or natural log of X minus 4 or something like that, you know, if u is x plus 3, or if u is x minus 4, du would just be dx. So you wouldn't have to really adjust anything. But let me clarify, sometimes you might have to make a slight adjustment to this. So the actual integral for this one would not just be natural log of 2x plus 3, because you'd have to let u equal 2x plus 3 
which causes du to equal 2x, which causes a one-half to be in there. I sort of took that for granted. It, we were right before, but I just didn't mention it until now. But it's because all those du's were just dx. They didn't have a 2 here or anything, or any other number. So I have to accommodate for that one-half. So let's go back over here to the beginning now. So let's dx over x cubed. That's not natural log. That is power rule. Power rule. So you just do x to the negative 3. So you just do, you know, x to the negative 3 plus 1 over negative 3 plus 1. So it's x to the negative 2, and you have a negative 2 on bottom, which will combine with the 1 third, and it makes it negative 1 over 6. Same thing here. Uh, 1 over x squared. That is not natural log. It's a power rule, which makes it x to the negative 1 over negative 1. So it changes that to negative 1 ninth, dividing by negative 1. And that one's x by itself would just be natural log of x. 17 over 27. Here you got these two. So the 2 goes into the 14 and makes it 7 over 27. So, All right. So you see we had two power rules and two natural logs. But we did have a du that we had to contend with there for that natural log. And I could go back up here to make sure my A, B, C, D match what I did up there. But I've checked, yeah, I've checked it before, but just wanted to show you this in case you wanted to look for yourself. But it, it, it matches. Now I'll let Maple do the entire integral here. And that matches what we have, uh, just in different order. Yeah, I don't mind negative exponents, personally, with answers with negative exponents. But if you're looking at a multiple choice question, it would probably give you a uh, drop, just like Maple did. It would probably would drop those down to the bottom. But I don't find a problem with it. That's why I gave it the U of H flag there, meaning that was fine with me. So if there was a student, if this was a class where you were working out the answers by hand, certainly leaving it in negative exponent form is, is fine with me. Now I'm going to show you another way to do the partial fraction decomposition. You can choose whatever you like. There really isn't a good rule to say which works better under what circumstances. I usually just kind of look at it and see what I think would work best. So it's not, I wish I could define it specifically when you should do this. Now I will tell you that I usually won't do this. If I have something like a binomial here, let's say if that 2x plus 3 was raised to the third power, then I would not want to use this because it would force a big old messy multiplication there, so I would not want to do this. So we're going back to this step right here, just starting back up here where we cleared the fractions, right there. So what we do is we distribute out everything on the right side. So we're not picking values and plugging them in. We're, we're uh, sticking them out and plugging uh, them. Yeah, we're not. So we're just distributing them through here. So we have, yeah, so A goes through here, makes 2AX plus 3A. Distribute BX here, you get 2BX squared plus 3bx. Distribute here, you get 2cx cubed plus 3cx squared, and you have dx cubed here. Now, so for every power we have on the left right side, we need the, the left side. So you see if there's x cubed over here, and there's not one on this side, so I'm going to give that a zero x cubed turns. So we, we need a coefficient over there. And the others are, I mean, we don't have to, but it just makes it easier to line things up if you do that. So what we're doing here is we're taking the right side after we distribute it out, and we're fact grouping and factoring by powers. So you see I have a 2c x cubed and a plus d x cubed. That means I can um, factor out an x cubed, and then I would have 2c plus d. So just basic, you know, greatest common factor idea. 2c plus d times x cubed. Now let's look at the x squareds. 
I have a 2b x squared positive and a positive 3c x squared. So 2b factor out an x squared, so I have 2b plus 3c times x squared. X's. I have a 2ax and a 3bx. So I factor out the x. I have 2a plus 3b times x. Then I look for any non-x terms. I only have one. Sometimes I have more than one, but only a 3a by itself. So here's what we do. Here's, here's how you think about this. So we're trying to match the powers from the right side to the left side. So if 2c plus d times x cubed needs to equal 0x cubed, that means 2c plus d has to equal that 0. So you're just setting what, you know, what you've got factored out there in, against 0. The so same thing for this one. I have 2b plus 3c x squared equals 1x squared. So therefore, 2b plus 3c would have to equal 1. Next one. If 2a plus 3bx equals x, that makes that one a coefficient of 1. It's just coincidence that these are all 1s. So that means 2a plus 3b would equal that coefficient 1 right there. And then the constant says we only have 1, 3a, so that has to equal 1. Now, uh, for that set of equations, I kind of the way I drew these arrows means the best way to do this one, I think, by manually, is I started from the bottom and worked my way up. It was actually quite easy. Because if 3a equals 1, that meant a equals 1 third. So if I now know what a is, I can plug that back to one line above it, plug in 1 third for a, and then I can easily solve for b. So I did that and got 1 ninth. Now that I know that B is 1 ninth, I can plug it one line above there for 2B. Put in 1 ninth for B plus 3C equals 1. So 3C equals 7 over 9. So C equals 7 over 27. And then um, I know that C is 7 over 27. So 2C plus D equals 0. So 2 times 7 over 27 plus D equals 0. And then D equals negative 14 over 27. And there you have it, the four values. And those are the same four values we got up here. Yeah, doing it the other way. So this was not a, this was not a different problem. So let me just clarify, this is still the same problem. It's just a different method for coming up for these partial fraction numerators. Just a different way to do it. So it's, you can choose whether you like it or not. Now, some of you may be familiar with matrices. I don't want to go into a big, long matrix discussion now. You know, you can you can obviously, you know, do some research yourself, Google matrices, and, and uh, especially how to do this in the calculator. But matrices are a way to solve a system of equations. And what you do is you line up all the coefficients here, and, you, and then the, this this side means what comes after the equal sign. And you have to put all four of them, A, B, C, D, up there. So you see this first equation, 2Z, do C plus D equals 0, means we have 0 for A, 0 for B, 2 is the coefficient of C. These are the coefficients. 1 for D, well, the right side is not a coefficient, but 0 on the right side. So if 2B plus 3C equals 1, that means A will be 0, B will be 2, because the coefficient of B, 3 for C, 0 for D, 1 for the other side. So here's 2A plus 3B equals 1. So 2 for A, 3 for B, 0 and 0 equals 1. And then 3A equals 1. You put 3 here and then 0 for everything else. So you get the 1 right there. So I'll just kind of run through this verbally real quick. So uh, look for the matrix button generally on the uh, left side of the calculator. Wake the calculator up here. Oh, there's something else I was doing. Matrix. Sometimes it's, it depends on the calculator. Sometimes it's the one of the buttons. This one that you have to go second matrix, second x to negative one to bring up matrix. So, but it should be on that left side, whether or not it's a se uh, second function or not. Then you go over here to edit. Edits when you want to create a matrix. 
So whatever letter you want, I just use that matrix A. I mean, obviously, if you had other matrices in there that you didn't want to violate, you can give it a different name. And then you have to enter in a matrix what's called its dimensions. It means number of rows by number of columns, including that far right column. So this matrix right here has four rows and five columns. So it's a four by five. It must go in that order. Four till it four, until it five, hit enter. That's going to bring up a matrix, matrix block for you. And you just type a number, and then you hit enter, and it moves over. So the cursor will move over to the right. Then you can hit the next number, enter, move over, and, and keep doing that until you've built your matrix. And then um, I, I go, at this point, I go quit and start over. So let me, sh I'll just show you real quick how to get to this command, at least anyway. So I just have done that. So I was just doing some other problem with matrices. Anyway. So, so let's say I went second quit after I ended the, ended the, entered the matrix. So I go back to matrix, and I go math. Math means we're going to do something to that matrix. I'll scroll down here. I'm looking for RREF, which is called row reduced echelon form. Right there. Now I'm going to go back to matrix, second matrix. So edits to create a matrix, math is to do some something to it, and names means you just go to this when you want to pick the matrix to do something to it. So now I want matrix A right there, so it's already highlighted. So I hit enter. See, it's putting A right there, and I'll, it might work even without closing the parentheses. But I just close the parentheses anyway by instinct. So now that's telling you it's going to do R ref to matrix A. That means that far right column is going to be the answers for each variable in order. So this means that for this one, A equals 0, B equals 5, and C equals 2. In that order. So in this case, you know, I got, I'm going A, B, C, D down the, down the order. And I went, you go, and you go math to frac. Math frac will turn those decimals into fractions. That wouldn't apply here because our numbers were already integers. So, but anyway, math frac enter. And that far right column right here, that is giving you all the values for A, B, C, D going downward in that order. It's basically saying that, okay, 1A equals 1 third, 1B equals 1 over 9, 1C equals 7 over 27, and 1D is negative 14 over 27. So you can certainly use matrices if you want to. Let's take a look at this one. Probably already had the answer there. I don't think the, something you should have to worry about for tests or anything like that. Maybe on a quiz it, 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 this is happening, but I can explain when I get to the answer how this happened. But what they did is they used log properties to take two individual logs and combine them together as uh, one single log. I, I don't think that that's that, that important to have to do, but that's what they did here. But I guess it you know certainly doesn't hurt to know how to do it though. I think so. It's a good skill to have. So I've got a repeated linear. So I'll have, now this time I chose to put the single factor first. Like I said before, I probably did that just to show you that it does not matter, which it doesn't. So I'll put the x plus 4 first, but then it does matter that I have three things here. An x plus 1 cubed, an x plus 1 squared, and an x plus 1. So I have four terms. All right, so nothing too fancy here, so I'm not going to explain it. We, we both apply by LCM to clear out the denominator. I'm kind of doing similar to the last one. I'm going to solve for two of the variables and then create a system of equations for the other two. 
So if you let x equals negative 4, that's a good one because it'll wipe out b, c, and d, and you solve for a. So negative 4 plus 1 is negative 3, cubed is negative 27, a. And then when you put in 4 on this left side, you know, use a calculator, obviously, but you're going to get negative 54. So essentially you have negative 27a, which I didn't write that out, but some people mistake that and call that negative 9, but no, negative 27. Negative 27a equals negative 54. That means a equals 2. Now I'm going to put uh, negative 1 would wipe out a, c, and d. Negative 1, put that on the um, on the left side, using a calculator or whatever, get negative 6. Put negative 1 in the only term left here, which will be b. That'll make that 3b. 3b equals negative 6. b equals negative 2. And now here's where I'm just picking values. See this, unlike the other problem I did where we had to use 0, this one I'm using 0 just because, especially on the left side, simple number to plug into that left side you get 14 and I'm using the a and the b in, in the problem there so I'm using the a and the b plugging in zero everywhere there's an x get 14 on the left side play around with this you get 20 equals 4c plus 4d uh, now I didn't write this out but I'll just say it verbally now I, you could have left it like that you didn't have to do what I did here but I just looked at it and saw immediately that everything divided by 4. So I just basically divided the whole thing by 4. So you can still use the 20 equals 4C plus 4D, but I, I reduced it to 5 equals C plus D. And the next X, I just chose 1, but you could have chosen anything you want. But I thought 1 was an easy one to deal with. We plug 1 in everywhere there's an X on the left and the right. We get 86 equals um, 2 times 8 plus negative 2 times 5 plus C times 5 times 2 plus D times 5 times 4. So when you take these two numbers, give you 6, move it over, subtract, gives you 80. 80 equals 10C plus 12D. I immediately saw that that reduced by 10, so I rewrote as 8 equals C plus 2D. So like I said, if you didn't reduce either of those equations, you can still solve it, no problem. So I have 5 equals C plus D, 8 equals C plus 2D. And then I, if I multiply the top one, and once again, there's more than one way to do this step. But if I multiply the top one by negative 1, I can add together and that will kill the C's. So negative 1 times 5 plus 8 is 3. C's are gone. Negative D plus 2D is just D. So D equals 3. So therefore, C plus 3 equals 5. C is going to be 2. Okay. We have... integrate it. Okay, let's see. This is my spot here. There we go. 2 over x plus 4. The 2 natural log of x plus 4. Negative 2 over x plus 1 cubed. That is power rule, or actually use substitution, but both technically. Because if you let u equal x plus 1, du will equal dx, so nothing to adjust for. So it would give you negative 2u to the negative 3 du. Use the power rule, what happens is the negative 2s are going to cancel. And you'll have a new negative 2 exponent. So you have x plus 1 to the negative 2. Uh, this one, same idea, but power rule. Um, u to the negative 1 over negative 1, so it's going to change this 2 into a negative 2. Makes that x plus 1 to the negative 1, or if you drop the negative exponents down back to the bottom, 
that's okay. And this one just being natural log. So you're putting natural log of x plus 1, and all that add together, plus c. So there's the repeated factors. Now the quadratic factors. Essentially, you know, I wrote this over here, um, not just because they're all plus, but if something is factorable, it does not fit this category. But remember something in um, algebra called the discriminant part of the quadratic equation, you know, ax squared plus bx plus c, a part that goes under the square root in the quadratic formula. So these problems will share this precise trait right here. So if you're not sure, you look at them, but like I said, it might be factorable, so check for that first. But if you Pretty sure you think it's not factorable. Look for this because it'll probably be this. Yeah, for example, let's say if it was x squared plus 5x plus 6. That would not fit this criteria. Because I would just factor into x plus 2 and x plus 3. So anyway, if the, if the discriminant b squared minus 4ac from these right values right here, that's less than 0, that falls into this category. Now, this seems a little weird how you, how you do this, but you just got to kind of get used to it because this is the way to do it. You have to, when you have one of those terms, you have to use either like ax plus b or bx plus c or cx plus d in the numerator. In other words, based on where you are at the current, you know, lettering of your decomposition. So, um, for this one, if I put the x first, I would give that an A on top of it. Now the x squared plus x plus 4, that does fit this criteria. You can check the discriminant. But anyway, if I've already used letter A, then that means I have to go BX plus C. You always have to go something X plus something. In other words, what I'm saying is if I had to put the x squared plus x plus 4 first, I would have had AX plus B, and then C would have been over the X. So that's what we're saying there. Now, I didn't work this one out, but I let Maple do it. We are going to work our own out here now, but I let Maple do it. But once again, let me mention that it's not uncommon. doesn't mean it's going to happen. Not uncommon, especially if there's ones that have two terms, if one of them turned into zero. That's fine. But guess what? If they don't turn into zero, you're going to have to split these up into two separate intervals. If they both if they both have real numbers, that's what would have had to have happened with this one. I would have had to split it up into two pieces to integrate it. Let's take a look at this example. Now x squared plus 16, not factorable. Every once in a while, I'll get somebody that will think that's x plus 4 times x plus 4. It is absolutely positively not that. Only x squared minus 16 would factor. x squared plus 4, 16 does not factor. It is this case right here. So I put it first. So therefore, that means it will be ax plus b. And then the x minus 3, then we'll have the c turn up with it. Now, okay, so we're going to clear out the denominator like we would do. So that's going to leave an ax plus b here times this will cancel and leave the x minus 3 with it. And here, this x minus 3 would cancel and leave the x squared plus 16. Now, I'm not sure why I did this. But I went with that alternative method. Maybe it was to, to show you. Because really, I mean, just mention this verbally. So if you want to try to, let me, let me scroll down here. Maybe I, I've already, okay, yeah, yeah, I did. Okay, I did it the other way. I just did the other method first. I still did the original, like all the original methods. So, yeah. Now I don't have to worry about saying that until we get down there. So I had to foil these two together, like so, and then just distribute C through here. And then, like I said, just, you group, did before you group them. AX squared plus CX squared. 
would be a plus c times x squared. I have a minus 3ax and a plus a bx would be minus 3a plus b times x. And I have two constant terms here, a minus 3b plus 16c. So that means a plus c x squared equals 2x squared. That means a plus c would have to equal 2. Minus 3a plus b would have to equal 5. And then minus 3b plus 16c equals 17. So I just put this in a matrix. If you want to do it that way, that's fine. Just have to be careful that when you put it in the matrix that the that you put the zeros in the right place. You notice we have a plus c equals two. That means there's no b there. So that that zero. So if you want a is one, b is zero, c has coefficient wise is one, and there's the two. So here I have negative three a for the next line, one for b. There's no c there, so I put a zero. And I put a five on the right side. And the last equation here, there's no a, so that's a zero. And I have a minus three b plus a sixteen c equals seventeen. So I did the row ref thing, so that guarantees me that the answers are A is 0, B is 5, C is 2. All right, so here's one like I was telling you. you know, we got a 0 there. That, that's okay. That isn't, that's not anything. The only time that would be wrong is if it was a distinct linear. But anything else, 0 has potential. So there are the three values. In this case, it might have been. So here's what I did this time. Using the original method, I would have put 3 in there. That wipes out A and B. So it is easy to get C here. You put 3 on the left side, you get 50. You put 3 on the right side, you'll get 25C. So 25C equals 50. Which means C equals 2. And then now you can put 2 in here. Now there's really, because x squared plus 16, there's no real number that's going to make that 0. So it appears that I just kind of took the equations we already had right here, like that, here in these equations. And I put the 2 in there for the C. So I, didn't really, I couldn't really finish this very well by using the uh, orig original method. But when you put 2 in there for the A, I mean for the C, that made A easy to get, obviously had to be 0. And then B is easy to solve from here. Or actually, if A is 0, you just put, yeah, 0 in there. That makes B 5. And, of course, C was already 2. So there we go. Now, because we lost the A, we don't have to split up that fraction. Because the A, is the, this problem is the one that has the X. So that zeroed out. So B is still left and C is still left. So the B was 5. So I have 5 over X squared plus 16 and then 2 over X minus 3. Now this here's what I was talking about earlier, the first time I come up, but this is where you know when you can expect some marked tans. X squared plus 16 definitely fits the inverse tan perfectly. So it's 1 over A with A being the square root of 16. 5 is just happens to be there. So 5 over 4, arc tan of x over 4, and that's just straight up natural log. So we have 2 natural log of x minus 3 plus c. So maybe we'll get, yeah, the next one we'll get to, well, they, one of them won't cancel to 0, and we'll have to split it up. So that'll, that'll be a good example. But this one we did, you know, we lost part of that numerator because A was 0. All righty, next example here, we got to do a little factoring. No problem, just pull out an x squared. And we have an x squared plus 25, so as long as we realize that x squared plus 25 does not factor, stop right there. x squared minus 25 we would have factored that into x minus 5, x plus 5. So I just chose this order. I started with the x squared, so I put a over x squared, and then it goes down to x, so that's repeated linear. 
So now we're combining a repeated linear with a quadratic. So it's a over x squared, b over x, and then we automatically, you start, so once you get the quadratic part, you start with the next letter, put it with x, plus the next letter. So if that was b, that means this becomes cx plus d. I know it seems weird, but that's the correct way to do it. Clear out the denominators. I'm left with this equation right here. So I distributed and got ax squared plus 25a plus bx cubed plus 25bx plus cx cubed plus dx squared. So now you see we have x cubes and x squareds on that right side. That's, that's not uncommon for this to happen. We've already done this one other time. It's not uncommon to put have to put zero terms out in front here. That's not too weird. So I group them, and I have b plus c times x cubed from here and here. So there's no x cubed, so that means b plus c would be zero. And now I have an ax squared and a dx squared, so a plus dx squared would be a plus d equals zero. Very good. So there's a zero over here. And now for x, we just have one x term, 25bx, so 25b will equal the 2 right there, that coefficient right here. And then we only have one constant term, 25a, so 25a equals negative 3. So, uh, so that we have that too. Now, for, immediately from these bottom two, we can get b and a real quick. b equals 2 over 25. A equals negative 3 over 25. Then once we have those, it's real easy to plug in A and B right here to get C and D, which because they're both being added together to get 0, that just means C and D are going to be the opposite of B and A. Negative 2 over 25 and then positive 3 over 25. Now we come down here and integrate. And let's see what we have. So once again, those constants that we got for A, B, C, and D, we just have to, you know, leave them alone and just, you know, count them as part of our answer. They don't really affect the integration process at all. Just make sure they're included with your answer. And so we have a dx over x squared. And a dx over x. x over x squared plus 25, and a 1 over x squared plus 25. That's, that's because, you know, yeah, I pulled out those coefficients. Yeah, I pulled them out. You know, you could have written them first, but I was just trying to save some time there. Now, we have a, a, a power rule for the first one, x to the negative 2. So you just do the power rules. So that gives you x to the negative 1 over negative 1. Now, x to the first power is natural log. Now, this one's also going to be natural log, but not for the same reasons that we've gotten the other natural log. It's because if you let u equal x squared plus 25, du will be 2x dx. So that means you've got a 1 half du. So that means this integral, I'm ignoring the minus 2 over 25 for a second. Obviously, I included it right here. But it's the integral is just 1 half du over u, which is natural log. So that one turned into natural log right here. So you see there's the 1 half from there, and then of course the negative 2 over 25, which is there from the partial fraction coefficient. And then the last one, when you have a number on top, and then x squared plus something, that is always arctan. You just follow the arctan formula. And it looks like, see, I, <laughs> I didn't bother to rewrite. I, I want to write it separately, so in case students in class, and especially whatever, Asked me a question. They were, why'd you say 125? You know, the, I want them to see the 1 over 5 from here. But I didn't feel like writing a whole line just to call that 125. But so, yeah, Maple multiplied those two numbers together. So, there it is. Fun with partial fraction decomposition. Okay, see, I'm not including case 4 in any exam. But let me at least, in all fairness, show you this. I feel it's my duty as an instructor, but I just kind of trying to help you by saving you, saving you something else I have to worry about. But this means you have it's it's 
repeated quadratic is combining case two and case three. So it has the quadratic from case three, x squared plus nine, but then it has the repeated part from the squared. So you would use that repeated part. So it have to have x squared plus nine squared, and then x squared plus nine right there. And then look at the numerators, because they both have that quadratic. Now, of course, you don't raise this to a power on top, but you'd have an ax plus c, and then plus a cx plus d. Sometimes these can get really wild and woolly here, but this one, uh, not too, too bad, because there's not any other terms in it or anything like that. Actually, ironically, you get two zeros here in this one, and it's not even the same. In other words, C is zero, so the X goes away on the one on the right, but B is zero, so that constant term goes away, and the X stays right there. So this one wouldn't have been too, too bad, and then here it comes down to this integral, where it leaves uh, a negative A. A goes in front of X, so negative 1 means negative 1X. One and then, of course, that, that D is the constant 1 right here. So this is a, a u substitution, x squared plus 9, so it makes it 2x dx. Not natural log like the last problem we had. Not natural log because of that square. Without the square, it would have been natural log. But it's a power rule, so it's u to the negative 2. So we do u to the negative 1 over negative 1, so you're left with x squared plus 9 to the negative 1. And, of course, this, this will be straight up arc tan right there. And then there we go. There your two. So you had four components originally, and it whittled its way down to two. Yeah, so I picked a relatively easy example, but I just figured, well, I mean, I've not enough time to ask every kind of problem on a test. You know, if I put a couple of partial fraction problems on a test, I you know, won't include this, this, you know, this problem, these, but they can get kind of rude. But this one wasn't. Especially if you start throwing in some other denominators in it, so. All right, I wouldn't worry too much about this one. I, I would, ugh, that one got kind of ugly. Now these, uh, my, I rearranged my notes a little bit, my lecture notes, because I find I've had so many, so many examples of my notes, and even in class it's hard to get through all of them. I guess I just kept expanding over the years, and hey, let's add a new problem. But for the purposes of this video, I'm not going to do all these, but this is not saying I'm omitting this idea. You know, I'm not saying omitted from test. I'm just omitting a video due to the, basically the, the length of, well, the problem itself, kind of, but more the length of the video, more than anything else. So these problems are perfectly, and the fractions are kind of weird on this one. Anyway, the, the problem itself, it's fine. So if it's one that you wanted to kind of like start off with and try to work it out yourself, you'd be able to check it out. I'm always, you know, Highly recommending as much practice as you can possibly get. You see the equations get a little scary for this one, too, that I really would not want. I mean, that's it's just a little messier than I'd prefer, but it's still a good problem, meaning, you know, if you can plow through this one pretty well, that means you kind of could do, for sure, do a repeated linear on a test. So, so that's what I'm saying. These aren't bad problems, so if you'd like to look at them, I, I would highly recommend studying them. But it's just, just too much time for this video if I explain it. Here's another one. This is not an invalid problem by any means. I just said omitted due to its length. And did the matrix. So it wasn't terrible, but just... Oh, the alternative method for this one was really a mess. <laughs> I, I, if you do, if you try that problem yourself, I wouldn't do this. Well, I mean, I don't know unless you want to, but... This gets a little messy in there. That multiplication is a little messy. went too far, but I, I kind of want to just show these problems of someone that's, you know, if they're not a student of mine, they're looking at these, they can at least look at these pages and pause them, you know, and take a picture of them, whatever, and if they try to work these out themselves. But these will still, these will, will still remain in my class notes, so if you're one of my students, it will, it will be in the notes. Okay, so we scroll down here, another one I just kind of did because of time purposes, but it would be an excellent practice for you. And then there we go. So that's why I kind of, this section of notes just was way too long, but I don't want to deny students from, you know, having those worked out problems as a resource. 
I just didn't want this video to go on for another hour or so. So, with that being said, that concludes this video on partial fractions, or maybe more accurate, accurately, integration by partial fractions.